Hi, this is Jeremy Clark, Executive Director of Grace Ministries International. Today we have Joy and Chuck Beefus and Sue and Bill Vinton. And I put those names in that order because I expect the ladies to have a lot to share today. Sound good? <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll let them. Yep, that sounds good to me too. <laughs> I'm sure Chuck and Bill wouldn't mind that a bit. So, <laughs> hey, Bill and Sue, we'll start with you guys. You're in your second field with uh, Grace Ministries International. You're in Malawi right now. Time has flown by. When did you guys arrive in Malawi? Well, we first came in 2013. <clears throat> After we left Congo, we drove down to Malawi. It took us um, a couple weeks to get here because we spent some time in Tanzania visiting there, but it was a long trip. And we spent five months here. And then in early 2014, we went back to the U.S., spent a year there, and then moved here in March of 2015. So before that, then, so 2015 is when you arrived in Malawi. You've been there about five years now. And uh, before that, you were in Congo. I, I, I can't remember. I think it was, uh, well, of course, I wasn't around then, but uh, was it 1983 when you guys arrived in Congo or when you guys set out for language school? Yeah, I think you weren't even born yet. <laughs> <laughs> I might have been 10. <laughs> we, yeah, we left the States in 83 and were in France for a full school year, so we arrived in Congo in 84. All right, we'll talk more about uh, Congo and Malawi. I'm kind of curious about some differences as you guys, you know, think about that in a moment here. But Chuck and Joey, you guys, you, you guys also arrived in Costa Rica, arrived in, in the field where you're at now back in the 80s. When did you guys get there? We came in uh, January 7, 1987. And we had Amber. She was a year and a half. And I was huge pregnant with Tara at the very end of my pregnancy. And so nine kids later... How many are left in the house? Yeah, none. Zero. <laughs> all alone. This is Empty I'm nesters <laughs> and enjoying I've, it. I've First seen Fane on campus. No children. Wow, that's going to be different. And I don't know yeah. what – Fane must have ate all the – he must have eaten all the food left over in the house because that kid is tall. He's a big yeah. boy. <laughs> the last one was the tallest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he certainly grew. He took advantage of all those tall genes, that's for sure. So, Chuck and Joy, you've been in Costa Rica for, well, I can't even count that. Was it 20-some? Uh, 33. 20, 30, 33 30, years. Oh, my. Okay, 33. I, I could do some math here. So, you guys have been in Costa Rica 33 years, and you're now uh, in, a, in a second church. And tell us maybe a little bit more about your ministry, what you're doing, and uh, then we'll go from there. Well, we're working on this uh, second church plant. Um, where God gave us last year a wonderful piece of property um, using an elderly lady who um, wanted to, to really sell to our church, though she's not a, not a Christian. So we're developing um, the ministry now um, three kilometers from the airport here in uh, Alajuela, of Costa Rica. Uh, and uh, so we're working on that big time. Uh, and then also we sent our first missionary, uh, Maureen in, in um, Alcuro to, to Panama and working uh, with that extension along with many other ministries here in Costa Rica. I know one of the big things you guys uh, work on is having a, a ministry team and um, you know Chuck maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that that group of guys that you're working with that ministry team you're working with how many there there are uh, what kind of roles they, they they serve in the church. Well we, we um, have worked in our church to get um, small groups or cell groups with connection groups uh, we call them our connection groups uh, in uh, geographical areas of, around our church. But also, um, God has uh, provided a number of young uh, men and new men uh, coming into our church, uh, where we want to develop them into becoming the elder pastoral uh, group of people in our church. Um, at the moment, we're doing a more uh, mentoring, uh, small group, uh, individual mentoring. Um, the hope is that, well, we were supposed to start our Bible Institute this month or around now. I, I, I began a, a new course at the beginning of January to open up to two or three courses by this time of the year. And the corona has sort of stopped that. But we're working with young men and a lot of other men that have come to our church. Now, good. Bill and Sue, I know you guys, uh, you know, have the same sort of philosophy of developing leaders and such. But before we get into that, uh, so you spent, you know, um, 
30 years in Congo and now you spent five years in Malawi. And it's not like just going to a different state in the United States and, and seeing the same fast food restaurants and, and more or less seeing a similar culture. But, you know, uh, tell us a little bit more about some of those big differences that you have seen between Congo and Malawi, some things that maybe surprised you or are very unique. Well, I don't know about uniqueness, but in Congo, we had a big organization structure with right. 600 churches. And so there was a lot more pressures and a lot more needs. And, and so we were, seemed to be bombarded with all kinds of opportunities. And the fact that we also had, you know, lots of people that are very qualified to work with. And so here in Malawi now, it's more of a smaller structure of 25 to 30 churches. And there's really only about four or five key men that I really can work with, you know, every day or see them every week. And so that, that's been quite a big difference. I would have to say that um, Congo, the key word that comes to mind is chaos. <laughs> um, whereas Malawi is much calmer and more organized. I, after living, um, you know, about 10 years in the city of Bukavu in Congo, I finally had just, you know, had it up to here with driving. And I got to the point where I just didn't even want to go out into the town and drive anywhere because I would be so hassled by police with false things that they're dreaming up to try to, uh, extort money out of you and they come to the you know they had guns a lot of times come into your car and stuff like that so but here in malawi so far really people Very the polite. police are polite for the most part and um yeah it's not it's not frightening it's not intimidating it's just a totally different experience in that aspect yeah when we drove in from tanzania it was only the first or second hour i got my first ticket and after the experience, it was just so, I was ready to say thank you. <laughs> right. The ticket didn't cost that much, and they were quite polite. I think, um, of course, there's a big difference in language. Right, I was going to ask you about that. Some people, you know, assume maybe some of the sub-Saharan Africans all speak sort of the same language, or there's a lot of countries that speak Swahili. So <clears throat> I think I also hope that we would find some Swahili speakers here. But in reality, it's a completely different language, and it's hard to be not fluent after having been fluent in Congo. So even though we've been here five years, we still don't feel fluent uh, in the language. So that's a, that's a frustration we only had at the very beginning of our time in Congo. Sure. Also, uh, we're living in a modern, well, I <laughs> qualify modern city. Um, here in Malawi, we're in the capital city. We usually have electricity and water. Um, we have like a modern grocery store that's air conditioned and has, you know, shopping carts or trolleys as they're called here. Um, so that's not, that was not the case in Congo. Um, like Chuck and Joy, we don't have any children at home. Whereas most of the years we were in Congo, we had kids. Last couple of them, we, the kids had left. But, so, no, the people are different. Okay. Congolese people yeah. are more direct. Yeah. Um, you feel like what you see is, you know, really what, what's there. Malawians are much more polite. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can't necessarily believe what they say all, all the time. Now, Bill, you mentioned that you're working with about four or five guys there in Malawi developing leaders. Uh, you know, that's come about over the course of these last several years and, and uh, tell us about some of the progress you've made in leadership development or, or maybe the team has. I know it's not all on you and it's not all your responsibility, but your ministry team, your missionary team, how have you guys seen the development of leaders there in Malawi? Well, one thing is that we felt that many and most of the leaders did not have really a good background in theological education or the grace message. So when I got here five years ago, they had opened up a Bible school and the teaching wasn't happening, but we got that going. And now we actually have like six centers, 
where we go and um, maybe 60 or 70 people involved in those centers that we're teaching. So that's made a big difference because now going to the churches, you know, you can really see that there, there is people, there are people that not only can tell you what they believe, but really believe it. And, you know, a lot of times, even when we're teaching, a guy will get up and say, you know, I just have to ask your forgiveness. And I didn't know this was uh, what I was teaching was completely wrong. And now I'm excited to go back and, you know, teach them uh, what they've been learning in Bible school. So that, that's, been, that's been encouraging. But uh, the point is, we don't have a lot of quality leaders that are good in English. And... Um, there's around four of them here in Milongwe, and so we do have um, meetings with them, to which Titus Lloyd um, conducts, but there's a good chance for me to be able to discipleship them because not only do I teach them, but being the oldest missionary here, they, they sort of see me as a father or, <laughs> or, you know, someone that can speak into their lives. So it's, it's encouraging to see a lot of them really growing and. Um, they're all pastors and to see how God is using them. Yeah. And so just to make it clear, you know, Bill, Sue, you guys travel for these uh, Bible school modules, maybe four or five hours away to go and conduct these week or maybe two week long seminars and, and uh, Bible school cl courses. And that's uh, quite an investment that you make, but also those teachers you're training, you're making that investment in them and helping them learn discipleship and evangelism and also how to teach the Bible. So it's been neat to see how you guys have been able to invest in others and invest, invest in those leaders. Um, Chuck and Joy, you know, when I think about your church there in Alawela, and just to kind of give people a perspective, it's right in the middle of Costa Rica, just the northwest of the capital, uh, San Jose. Um, and uh, I think about your church. And so you mentioned you have this property, you're developing leaders, you've just sent one of your top I guess you want to call leadership families as missionaries to Panama uh, within the last couple of years or last year or so. And also you have plans. You're thinking about church planting. And I want to know how, or maybe you can explain because people watching this and they, they have their church here in the state they attend or whatever. How does a church develop a culture like that where you're thinking about so many different things and you're able to look in so many different directions at one time? Well, just a, a, a teaching and a, um, throwing out ideas continually of where we're headed, uh, having some kind of a, a, a vision that we're going to be um, working outwards, not inwards. So I've been telling people from the time we planted this church that um, once we have a building, which now we do, um, that will be the marker, which I thought would be about four years ago, to start uh, meeting with specifically men from some area we've talked about Heredia and we've talked to men that live far away and maybe they're even involved in other ministries also people in in, in our church who are from uh, uh Heredia that you know let's start meeting once we have a building and and we're going to start the next church once we had this building so once we um had bought the physical building and brought it in from Canada um last year was a big year of talking about that let's remember people once we have this building up What's interesting is, again, we have a building up, but it's not near completed. But that doesn't matter. So we're, we're just talking about it. We've sent these people, um, uh, Alvaro and Marwan, to, to Panama. And the idea is, okay, we've gone to Nicaragua. We've gone to uh, Panama. Where are we going next? And, and so we're telling young people and, and people in our church right now, well, where do you want to be a missionary? You want to go to Hon uh, Honduras? How about Colombia? And, and talking about contacts we have. So it's a continual uh, repeating, giving the ideas until the idea is, oh, let, let's do that. Or I'd, I'd like to be a, a, a missionary. Um, and, and that's what we continually need to be doing. That's just throwing out the ideas and always saying, let's go out outwards. Yeah. If you're not, if you're not looking to expand and grow, you're just going to eventually contract because you're always thinking about yourself and conserving what you have. So you always have to be looking out and, and pushing and, and, and finding where those open doors are by pushing on lots of them and, and pursuing it. And also people aren't going to get involved in ministry unless there's a, a need for them to be involved. And if they have, you know, a pastor, a, a music person, a youth person, and that's, that's it. And the church is fine. You know, there's really no reason to ever get involved. 
So you mentioned this property and you're kind of in the process of, of doing the construction, but um, right in the middle of the construction, that's when the government there in Costa Rica started reacting with respect to the spread of the, this new coronavirus. And tell us a little bit about the impact that the government, um, uh, the, their, their reaction had on the ministry in Costa Rica and, uh, and what you guys have not or have been able to do, haven't been able to do, and how has it affected things for you? Well, I know that it's actually this coronavirus has been a little bit positive as far as like, like we're doing Zoom, we're doing all these ministries all the time. Like every Saturday, there's Zoom ladies group and men's group. And like 13 to 15 ladies connect in and uh, we do music, prayer, and somebody brings the lesson. So that's been super good. And the men do it and on Saturdays too. And then we're doing live stuff on Tuesdays. And then um, there's a message every Sunday that, that we tape on Thursday. And then they meet um, for the, the board meeting everything the men's the pastorals team meets on zoom everybody's just keeping on going on with zoom so I, i'm happy about that that we haven't like everything hasn't shut down yes the alas group and the junior high group we can't do there is the high school group that's meeting scales every week and lucy chavez has helped with that bringing in new ideas so she's back in costa rica and um so that's been that's been really good. I don't know. I'm happy that we are continuing on. We have a a six member ladies group that that plans everything and is still connecting. What's apps all keep the church connected. So I'm grateful for that. But in other words, everything was stopped all of a sudden mm -hmm. on May the 14th or something. Boom, mm -hmm. can't meet, can't do anything. So all the rules came out, and so therefore you have to figure out, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to stay connected? So how long is that? I mean, how, do you have any idea when the rules are going to be uh, relaxed? And I was looking online this morning and it looked like, you know, today you still have single digit deaths in a country of what, five or 6 million people. Yeah, so we, we've only had around 700 some cases, only seven deaths. Um, so they're in huge control of the situation. They've, they've been registering three, two, five per day who've gotten sick. Um, but only seven deaths. And, and so you'd think that they would be starting to talk about opening, but we just found out today, um, the official news was they're keeping everything closed until at least June 15th. And, and th that's huge. I mean, for a tourist kind of a country, right? nothing is going to be open. Uh, it, we wonder how everything's going to, you know, we are working to help out the needs of our people in our church and in the extended people, but I don't, I don't know how this is going to happen handle this country yeah. that's they, even the mail i i wrote a ton of thank you notes to supporters and you can't even send out the mail costa yeah. rica is closed down even you know like if we want to leave we're residents then then we can't really come back or we lose like our permanent residency it'd be super complicated so and for our kids even to come and visit they'd have to go into quarantine for 14 days so nobody's really thinking about coming or going. Yeah, you know. and, and uh, I know it's tough in Latin America. Most most people are working, you know, maybe that week for that week's necessities and their, their food, their, their things they need. In Africa, you know, it's, it's, it's like that as well. In fact, you're probably working that day for that day's needs. And, and Bill and Sue, when I think about Malawi and I think about, uh, you've described it before as being, you know, one of the poorer parts of, um, of Africa and one of the needier parts of Africa, what, what, uh, what are some of the developments there in Malawi with respect to what the government has enacted or how they've reacted to um, the corona, this new coronavirus? Well, um, most Malawians here don't believe it's real. Hmm. There are a lot of conspiracy theories about the government. And this is a, this is a political time in Malawi because we are awaiting a re-election on July 2nd, because the election that was la took place last May in 2019 um, was annulled. So people are waiting for a re-election, and that means uh, things are a bit politically unstable for Malawi. I mean, you know, in comparison to other politically unstable countries, we can't compare it in that way, but 
Um, really, the government wanted to do a shutdown here, but I think it was two days before the shutdown date had, that had been announced, there was a big uprising and a human rights group took an appeal to the court, got an injunction um, for the government to not be able to start the shutdown. So anyway, um, it didn't happen because of the concern. Really, it was the concern of hunger. Um, as you say, you know, we, we eat tonight what we earned today. And so there was a real risk of hunger, uh, malnutrition for children and women particularly, if they were to do a shutdown like they had talked about. So it seems like it's out of the picture now, like it's not really going to happen, but they did close all the schools. Um, and there are currently 57 cases that have been announced, and there are 30 that are active, and three people have died. But of course, there's not a whole lot of testing that's going on. There is some testing, but you know. So how has it impacted this country? Uh, schools closing is a big impact. A lot of students, university students, you know, primary kids, everybody's pretty upset about it. They're talking about trying to do online school, but you know, as Chuck and Joy shared about Zoom, Malawi is not a country with uh, enough of that kind of technology. So most people, you know, are lucky to have a phone and not a smartphone. So WhatsApp and Zoom don't happen with a lot of people. Um, so really we have not had any Zoom meetings with any of our Malawian colleagues, though we do have some WhatsApp kind of conversations. So it has had a big impact in that, in that aspect. Um, but it's hard because there's no running water in so many places and even no soap. So the whole hand washing thing is even rather unrealistic in most village situations and even in town. You know, if you go shopping and stuff, you have to plan your, your day, your time, your shopping trip so that you don't have to use the bathroom. <laughs> so, but they do have hand washing stations now at most stores, have a bucket system outside the store where you can wash your hands. And some are very adamant, you're required. In fact, I went and got tires the other day and when I parked my car, as I was getting out of my car, the, the guard at the gate of, the, of the, the tire place came and told me I had to wash my hands and then he was taking my temperature. Mm. So he held the thing up to my forehead and then he showed me what my temperature was and said I was good to go. But what thing is, yeah, yeah, one thing it's done for us is it, we just limited our travel. Sure. Oh, very much. And so we can't go to these places that we normally go to, particularly the season beginning here, April, May, June, July, and August is when we do most of our teaching. And um, uh, the churches are still going on, but um, we've closed the Bible school for a while when they were keep on changing things, it's gonna be locked down and it never happens. And so anyway, we have a field meeting on Zoom this Friday. We'll decide what's happening with that. Some of the problem also is um, because of public transport right. being crowded and you know not the safest way and most people here to go anywhere have to take public transport so that's another problem and for me I would like to be going out to the village doing the children's ministry but <clears throat> it seems a little bit audacious when the government has closed schools then for you know us to go out to a village and say okay now you 50 kids, come on, let's go. Let's go into this building and have our lessons. I don't know. Somehow I feel a little bit insubordinate right. if, I, if I do that because I'm a guest here. Right. But at the same time, I feel like these kids are all playing together in the village. They're not doing any social distancing whatsoever. They're not going to school. So then I feel like we're wasting the opportunity to be going out there. So I find that to be troublesome. Sure. You know what? I got to think. About in Africa too, you know, for years, decades, you know, you have, well, centuries, you have malaria, you have uh, now, you know, AIDS the last several decades. And these are big diseases that get a lot of press. People talk about, people die by the, by the millions in, in Africa because of these diseases. And so I wonder if it's difficult then for people to, to appreciate or to even consider a new disease that might be coming along that they're hearing about that came from some other continent. 
you know, there's got to be a different, uh, you know, way for them to approach it. It, yeah. At, at the same time, some have seemed to um, say, you know, when AIDS, AIDS took so long to really get into the consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so at least they're prepared mentally to accept that there can be this kind of an illness that spreads quickly. It, it killed off, you know, so many people. But at the same time, we also see that people are saying they think it's all just a conspiracy of the, <laughs> of the government trying to affect, the, trying to impact the election that's supposed to take place on July 2nd. So you, Bill and Sue, you guys, you know, you watch the news, you guys are in touch with people back here in the States and, and, uh, and so on. Why did you guys decide to stay in Malawi and, and not uh, leave, leave Malawi when you had a chance to do so? And why are you still there? Well, I guess the pandemic to us is less frightening than a lot of things that happened to us in Congo. Right. You know, because of the political situation there and the gunfire and battles and stuff. And um, here we never really felt God asking us to move or to go. We don't believe in tempting God, but we, 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 we do know that when we stayed in Congo during some wars, it really brought credibility with us and the people. It deepened our relationships with them. Um, being able to share some of the, the common hardships. And we were able to meet some of the needs there, you know, that, that occurred because of the situation. And so I think that, you know, it just never crossed our minds because God wasn't leading us that way. And the door was open, even though right now, my main ministry is I'm writing two Bible school courses and a seminar. And so I do a lot of reading and working in the computer and um, that's what takes most of my time. And I'm writing, working on the lesson book that I would be working on anyway. I'm just working on it a little bit more than I would otherwise have been um, to, get, to get the lesson book ready for us to be able to, when we are able to travel, to be able to go and hold uh, training seminars for children's workers. So I am able to use WhatsApp to text the lessons the Chichewa lessons to a couple of the different people who are correcting the Chichewa, going over them and stuff like that. So that at least is, is helpful. Yeah. Now, Chuck and Joy, you guys mentioned a little bit ago that your, your church has been able to help those who are in need and people who have some, some difficulties right now. So what are the, the travel restrictions like? I mean, you must, people must be able to get out and about and visit other people then, um, at least to some degree, but tell us about that ministry of helping other people in your church and maybe a little bit more about um, how restricted you are uh, in terms of in-country travel. We have this, we have this, um, it's called Bondad and Amor, um, mm -hmm. love and kindness, where, where every month there's money put aside to help people that have need. So that's, that's a money thing. And then there's like Chuck and I are going every Tuesday and getting together baskets or desserts and and going and visiting all the people in our church and we stay outside and we just hand it to them and they're so happy so thankful so encouraged so it's been good because at first we thought well maybe the people here wouldn't like that because they're all staying in because they're afraid but no they're they're super grateful to to if we just come to the door and give them a dessert check on them ask them if they have any prayer requests if they have any financial needs and so that's that's been good right we we, we can do that on a tuesday because our license plate allows us to drive on that day okay. we can't drive on other days during the the, the week so it, it all depends that is also true with getting together other activities of ministries you have to work out the license plate to be able to to be, be a, with a few people that are going to tape a message or or if we're going to, you know, talk about an offering of, of this kindness and love group, people are giving extra money towards that so that there is more money available for the people that are in, in need. And really, in Costa Rica, everything closes down at 7 at night, Monday through Friday, and the weekend's 5 o'clock. Like, wow. people just don't go out. You're not allowed to drive your cars. You can walk, but most people really stay in their house. They're, like, afraid. And, and Costa Ricans are such clean people anyways. Sure. That's why it's not spreading because they're all clean, always taking showers, perfume, everything. So 
Well, I can remember being in the in, in some of the major stores there in Costa Rica and going in the bathroom and you have two or three employees who were in the sink practically bathing before they went on, you know, before they went on the bus or before they went on on, on the work duty. So yeah, I, I can appreciate that. Um, t- tell me this then, you know, I know that uh, Chuck and Joe, you guys like to, to look forward. You like to, to think about next steps, think about um, other ministries and keep, like you said, Chuck earlier, throwing out ideas. And with the fear within the Costa Ricans and they're probably thinking about this situation all the time. It's probably on their minds all the time. They have jobs they don't want to lose. They have kids that are not sure how they're going to get through school and such. How are you guys able then to keep uh, ministry and sort of a forward looking approach to ministry on their minds, even during this time? I think that's, I think it's one of the most frustrating things about it because uh, it's, uh, it's nearly impossible to be, to be talking about the future. In fact, okay, we, we put up a metal um, hangar type of building for our church. Mm-hmm. And there's all kinds of work to be done. And, and there, there are people who continue to work in their jobs. And so we talked about there's three construction workers, whether they work with us or someplace else, we could have it continue to, to work. And, and our church people had the opinion, not all of them, but you know, opinion that no, we must obey everything, no work whatsoever. Mm. So it's almost like, no, until we are open, we can do more. And that's why we were afraid that maybe even going to visit people because, um, you know, you're going to wear your mask, you're going to be distant. Maybe you shouldn't even go and visit these people because we have felt like there's nothing. It's stopped. And I, I just feel like that's, we're stopped until this opens up. Other than that, we can do things with technology. Sure. Now, I know one of the frustrating things for a lot of us here in the States, and probably it is for you too, is that um, it's really difficult to get an answer as to when things will, will, will kind of resume some sort of normal, you know, semblance. And, and so that's difficult as well when you think about planning. But um, Chuck and Joyce, when you guys look here and you, you think about maybe getting past this immediate, you know, crisis that, that we're in, uh, what are some goals that you want to see realized or some th- steps you want to take and some next next steps in the ministry you guys want to see happen? Well, the first has to do with the, the, the property where we need to finish up the building. We need a, a, a home to guard because of um, the tendency of people robbing everything. So we need a home so that we can have a family in our of our church on, on the piece of property where we have our church. Um, and the whole development of, of that land into areas of ministry. Um, what I, we mentioned before, and is we, we, we were able to go to Panama to encourage and be a part with Alberto and Marin um, in, in February, um, just before this happened. And the plan is to continue with that, to uh, be working with them and encouraging um, them in their ministry, seeing if other people want to be missionaries, whether they're at other places. Uh, and then the idea of, of meeting with, once we get going again, meeting with uh, the idea is meet with a, a group of five to ten men during one year, praying about the next church plant, and, and then meeting with the, the, the wives and then their families, and, and within a couple of years have that second, the next uh, church up and running someplace. We did, we did have planned to go in July to see Maurin and Alvaro again in Panama, a big trip, but we'll see what happens with that. But as soon as we can, we want to get all the ministries up and rolling. Aaron started Allah's group for the first time, a children's class, like Awana. And um, she added all shirts, you know, um, just everything organized. And your church, Jeremy, Grace Bible Fellowship, uh, Caleb's church came down. It was a great push. We did it two weeks, and then the government closed down for Corona. But... We got to get all those things up and running and get it in the minds of the people that we are going to get this building done because sometimes they don't even want to think about starting another church in it area because we're so like just getting going with this new one, well, with the physical building and everything. Yeah. I know you'll keep pushing and I know that you'll, you'll, you'll keep prodding them along and it'll, it'll happen. So yeah. that's, that's, that's good to hear. And I'm glad you guys have those ideas and, and that vision going forward. Uh, Bill and Sue, you know, I know that your team, uh, the missionary team, which is the biggest in GMI, you know, you guys have, um, you guys have gone through quite the process of doing strategic planning, like all of our fields do. Uh, but for you guys is a little unique because you have, um, 
you have families from all different cultures on your missionary team, uh, different countries in Africa, as a matter of fact. You have missionaries who were missionaries in other countries before. In fact, I think all the, uh, uh, the, non, or the, the U.S. missionaries that are in Malawi used to serve in a different field at one time. And now they've all come to Malawi. And I've got to ask you, you know, um, personally, how, what have you guys learned or how has the Lord um, helped you to grow as you have worked on this international missionary team there in Malawi? Well, it's a lot different because in Congo, we were sort of by ourselves in Bukavu for at least uh, 12 years that we were in that city. And so it's great to be together with a team. And um, one of the couples is down in Tajja, which is a four hour drive working in Muslim area, mm -hmm. Eric and Mercy. So we don't see them as much, but it's been good because uh, the, the people we work with really have a heart for reaching people and not just sitting around and doing nothing. They really want to get involved and whether it's doing sewing classes or cooking classes or evangelism or teaching, they're always wanting to do something to affect the church. And so that, that, that's, that's great to be with. And, and they really have different perspectives than us Westerners. And they're not afraid to come up and say, you know, maybe that thinking is, is would work well in America, but maybe not too well here. And of course, them, you know, growing up in Africa and ministering and then in places in Africa have a lot of value and wisdom in, in, in helping us out. I learned a lot from Sylvia Nyakambiri because, you know, she's originally Zimbabwean. And it's a, it, it's a town, I mean, a country close, not, not far from here in Malawi. So she seems to understand the culture a lot better than I do. She knows the kinds of questions to ask people. And she can kind of say, in Zimbabwe, we do this. What do you do here? And there's a lot of, uh, you know, conversation in that, in that aspect. So she's a real help to me to try to, you know, get, uh, understand maybe what's going on and what's motivating somebody. And, you know, she understands the whole thing of agriculture and the funeral system and, you know, cooking with charcoal and <laughs> just all things about evil spirits that they might believe. And so it, it is, it actually is quite helpful, I think, to have um, somebody that I can totally relate to. Um, and yet at the same time, she can really give me, such a good picture and better understanding. Um, I also think that maybe it's made me a little bit more polite in, in, <laughs> in field meetings. A little bit. <laughs> um, you know, because when we're in meetings, um, I try to be a little bit more considerate than I might otherwise be if everybody were an American. <laughs> so I don't know if I succeed. You'll have to ask them. Yeah. But um, <laughs> time is money doesn't go over well. Sure. Try try not to offend maybe as much as I might otherwise. No, I I think that's uh, that takes a lot of humility though to have over thirty plus years of ministry under your belts there, but to still always be looking for ways you can learn from others. And I think that's really really neat. Uh, one of the one of the selling points or one of the ways I attempt to sell missionary life is talking about our international teams and how diverse and how unique they are. And, and uh, it's just a great way to learn more about yourself, but uh, other cultures and how to interact differently in different circumstances. So Bill and Sue, as we conclude, I want to ask you guys, um, you know, uh, maybe what are some ways that we can pray for you as, in, in the ministry as you're looking forward and you're looking maybe to getting past this, this time as well? Well, um, for me, it's, 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 it's a welcome time to concentrate really on writing. Mm -hmm. One of my goals that I made when I was in America is to have a discipleship program in 10 local churches. Mm -hmm. And so that means when the discipleship program goes into the second generation of those churches. And so after I finished writing this course on um, dispensationalism number two, I'm going to write one on discipleship number two, which will promote that whole idea with teaching them 
and going through that whole program with them so that they can be able to start it. So for me, I will have to go and visit these churches a lot. But right now I can do the legwork of writing it sure. and um, be able to teach it once that opens up. And for, even just for being able to make the decision of, you know, what to do, because some of the stuff is not, you know, closed off to us because of government regulations. Some of it is our own choice. Sure. And, you know, we have different reasons for, you know, coming to the decisions that we have come to um, about staying home. And also, like I mentioned about going out, let's say to the village to do children's ministry there, um, just when to start doing that. Is it the smart thing to do? Should we wait? The first case in Malawi was only April 2nd. So, you know, it's only been just over a month now and 57 cases since that time, which, you know, we don't know. Is it because of lack of testing? Is it because of the weather, have the heat having an impact? But we are coming into, we're starting a winter. We're in fall now. Sure. So it's just, a difficult decision to make to have uh, wisdom for that. Now we'll pray for those things and, and Chuck and Joy, how can we pray for you guys? We, we pray for this uh, virus and, and two, or, two or so weeks ago, I started asking questions of through the technology of, you know, when we do begin to open up, if it's at a 25%, 50% capacity, are we even ready for that? Can we even do that? Um, and so I've been trying to push and, and uh, motivate people to say, hey, maybe we need to make some decisions that go against a little bit of the flow. Um, so we also need prayer for wisdom in this too, because to, to, to my understanding of what I'm thinking is we should probably be doing some construction work, getting prepared for when we can get back to a 25%, 50% people coming to the church. How will we do that? How will we do all the, rotations if, if it's through alphabetical order or or whatnot for the church um and 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 then once we can get back to a little bit more of normalcy um just to start the whole plan over again it's one thing to get it going and having it motivated and going and all suddenly it putters out and then to have to start i wonder sometimes if people are so relaxed and enjoying their weekends and you know not having to ever go anywhere and and it's right at their you know, tear or even bed, and, and and a lot of people put on Zoom, and they leave the the the, the video off, and, and who knows if they're even there, or if they're laying down and snoozing or seeing something out. I'm going, oh my goodness, God, I, I just pray that this doesn't, you know, this motivates us, doesn't turn turn us to cold coldness. I know, and for me, I guess I'd like wisdom and humility, and continually working with the people. And remembering that we are guests, like Sue said, in this country. Mm -hmm. And that's super important, right, as missionaries. Well, thanks, guys, so much for sharing. I think I get this right. I think it's 120-plus collective years of missionary wisdom in the short <laughs> amount of time that you guys shared. So uh, thanks for condensing that all. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we appreciate the time, guys, and we'll be praying for you. And thanks so much for, for just talking about your ministries. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day, everyone. Nice yeah. to see you, Bill and Sue. You too. <laughs>